My name is Lowell Taub. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Stoked Management Group, um, which we launched. Uh, we're just coming up on our one year anniversary. And I've been representing athletes for 25 years um, and kind of through the Olympics and the outdoor space. It was, you know, Bodie Miller and Julia Mancuso were clients of mine in 2002 and on to Sean White in 2010 and uh, have since added Nigel Houston and Chloe Kim and John John Florence and Jordan Barrett, who's over in uh, Tokyo right now with an event coming up, Sky Brown over in Tokyo with an event coming up. So we've cultivated um, a niche and an expertise in working with uh, Olympians and action sports athletes and, and athletes that kind of really live in an outdoors uh, type world. Those awesome. are some iconic names. That's super exciting. I didn't know that you wrapped Nija. So that's, that's really cool. Our eyes are on him for the skating world right now. Um, yeah. Why would you say that brand should be looking at Olympic level athletes versus more of an amateur athlete? Yeah, well, um, Olympic level athletes, you know, bring a, a, a huge level of exposure for a brand. So if you take, um, Chloe Kim, as an example, you know, Chloe was, you know, the, the best, you know, arguably the best athlete in her sport. And she actually had qualified for the 2014 Olympics, but since she was 13 years old due to age restrictions, she was not able to go and represent the U S. So as much as she was the queen of, uh, uh women's half pipe snowboarding alongside Kelly Clark, uh, in 2014 and 15 and 16 and 17, you go to the Olympics and it's a life changing moment because you kind of go from the people watching the X games and the people watching the do tour and the people paying attention to snowboarding to overnight being on the biggest global stage to billions of uh, sports fans all over the world. And you can extrapolate that, right? For, I, I didn't start representing Sean White until 2010, but in 2006, same thing. Sean White's a very big deal in snowboarding, but he wins the gold in Torino and, and overnight it kind of changes his life. And, and it has been that way for generations uh, that the spotlight uh, and the scale of the Olympics can be life changing for an athlete if they go there and, and you know, win a gold. And, and America is a very, uh, you know, we like gold medals uh, as a society and, and we like and appreciate and, and, uh, give all the accolades to winners. So yeah, it, it's really just the scale and the visibility that the Olympics brings. Uh, and I think snowboarding was a really, really good example of that. You know, it was kind of a, a counterculture sport, you know, from when Jake Burton helped innovate and invent it in the late seventies into the early eighties and boom, it goes in the Olympics and it levels up. And then a star like Sean White comes along in 2006 and it's a, it's a game changer. Absolutely. Yeah. Sean White really, really changed that sport in an incredible way. Um, and what, what are some of the rules around working with Olympic athletes if you're a brand? Yeah. So there is something called rule 40, uh, which does kind of, you know, can, can sound intimidating to brands. And what I will say is it, there's great news. It has really evolved. So I've been representing Olympic athletes since 2002 and Bodie Miller, which I mentioned, and the rules have completely evolved. So there was a moment, let's just take 2002 as an example. And if you were Bodie Miller and you were an ambassador for um, uh, Barilla Pasta and Barilla Pasta had a billboard of you in Times Square, even having nothing to do with the Olympics, the old rule was, hey, we're the Olympics. We want to give category exclusivity to our partners during the Olympic period. So if you're Barilla Pasta or Red Bull or Rolex and you have a deal with uh, an athlete, you have to black out that deal entirely from the two weeks before the Olympics, the two weeks during the Olympics and the two weeks after the Olympics. So athletes and agents kind of for decades threw up their hands and say, wait a minute, you're saying at the height of our of our marketing power and our visibility, even though this deal pre-existed and we're not even leveraging any Olympic stuff. We're telling uh, Bodie Miller is a badass skier message. You're, we have to, you know, take down a cardboard cutout at your local Whole Foods. Uh, and, and the answer was yes, there just was no two ways about it. 
Um, it has evolved. I actually have a client who really was a loud voice in the evolution of it named Sonia Richards Ross, because it, it takes somebody who's a star to say, hey, I can deal with Rule 40. I make a lot of money from endorsements, but this really isn't fair to the archer and the loser and the Taekwondo athlete. They need to be, present value to their sponsors. It's not fair, you know, in no other sport in the, in the NFL, Tom Brady doesn't have to black out anything. In the NBA, LeBron doesn't have to black out anything. So it has evolved and where it has landed now is basically the IOC and the USOPC has said, as long as you don't mess with, with our, Olymp uh, our intellectual property and our verbiage, you can do whatever you want. So the example they often use is way back when we represented Andy Roddick, right? So Andy Roddick was an ambassador for American Express. The Olympics are sponsored by Visa. Let's say American Express put an Andy Roddick billboard up in Times Square on June 1st that was actually hyping the U.S. Open on September 1st. Nothing to do with the Olympics. Andy Roddick's a full-time tennis player who happens to, you know, go to the Olympics once every, um, you know, four years. You know, if he if he does go to the Olympics, uh, sorry, I got a phone ringing here offline. Um, so literally, the old rule was that American Express was forced to drop a tarp over that billboard in Times Square for the six-week extent of the blackout period. Because those were the rules. You're Andy Roddick. You're going to be an Olympian. You can't do anything for Amex. Now, if that exact same thing happened today, as long as it doesn't use the Olympic rings, a, a picture from the Olympics, an Olympic medal, you know, or say the word Olympics in it, that billboard can stay there. They have finally evolved to say kind of, you stay out of our lane and, and you can keep doing, which is no different than, you know, if you're not an official NFL sponsor, you aren't supposed to say NFL superstar Aaron Rodgers. If you're not an official New York Yankees sponsor, you're not supposed to use a picture of Aaron Judge in the pinstripes. You can use Aaron Judge in a, in a generic white, you know, baseball uniform, but not in the Yankees intellectual property. And finally, the USOPC has evolved to the same kind of standard of rules of don't use our intellectual property. And they finally have evolved to say, it's actually great if Rolex and American Express and Red Bull are telling more Olympic stories and spending more media dollars hyping Olympians. That's good for the Olympic movement. And they have finally evolved to kind of say, you stay out of our, you know, our stuff and, and we'll stay out of your stuff. So it sounds like a brand that is not an Olympic partner is now being a little bit more encouraged to sponsor these athletes and to help them get to their competitions because we know that they're, they need the money to do that. So if a brand doesn't have Olympic level money, how do they get involved? What's the best way to actually access Olympic athletes and work with them? Yeah, Olympic level money is, uh, you know, is a moving target. So again, if Chloe, you know, I happen to be in a, in a, in a privileged position of working with superstars like Chloe Kim and John John and Nigel Houston and uh, you know, I drive a hard bargain and ask for a lot of money. So whatever that, whatever Chloe Kim costs, but there are athletes out there. Think of if there are four female snowboarders that are going to go to the Olympics for the half pipe, the second and the third and the fourth might have a far different, you know, price range than Chloe Kim. And, you know, to make it anonymous and just say, if a star costs a million dollars and the number two athlete on the team costs 150, the number three athlete might cost 50 and the number four athlete might cost 10. So there, there is, you know, and there are, so there are, you know, hundreds of athletes out there um, who have all different price ranges and that's up for them and their agent to set a price for. So there is still accessibility to leverage an Olympian to tell your brand story. Uh, and, and it could even be a first social media one-off like, Hey, we just wanted you to talk about this granola bar or this headphone in an Insta post, you know, on July 18th and, you know, boom, in and out, it's this much money. You know, you can do 90 day partnerships, six month partnerships, 12 month partnerships. So it's not like there's a hard and fast rate card, right? If, a, if an outfield sign at Yankee Stadium costs a million dollars and they say that's what it costs, there, there's more art than science when it comes to partnering with an Olympic athlete that, you know, you can go out and target somebody. In fact, stoked, I, you know, I will, you know, kind of in humbly say to your audience, 
we're also, as much as our day job is representing athletes and being on the sell side of the transaction, we also represent brands. So if a brand came to us and said, Lowell, we want to leverage the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing. Can you come up with a strategy? We have a bucket of money of $30,000. Can you help us align with the right athletes to, to get our message out there at $30,000? The answer is, yeah, we can help them align with, again, an alpine skier or a figure skater or a speed skater or a snowboarder or a luge athlete or whatever it is. Uh, and whether that bucket is 300,000, 30,000, or, you know, whatever that is, we can try to help them find athletes that can tell their story, you know, in the Olympic universe. Um, so there is definitely accessibility without writing kind of the seven or eight figure check that a visa and a Procter and Gamble writes to be the official credit card of the Olympic movement. You can go find three great athletes with good social media followings and authenticity and, and have them do, you know, a social media plan that at $60,000, you're, you know, communicate, you're, you're basking in the halo of the Olympics and the rings at a much uh, more accessible price point than some of the big boys that are spending eight figures to be, to actually have the rings in their TV commercial. Yeah. yeah. And logistically, it makes sense then for them to work with someone like you that knows the rules instead of having, you know, to study rule 40 and figure out how to navigate around it without basically getting legal action thrown at you, which the IOC will do. Yeah, look, the yeah, yes. Uh, uh, in a short answer, yes, you should they should all be coming to Stokes to help them navigate <laughs> those uh, those legal issues and what the appropriate talent is for them. Yeah. Now, one last question for you. We've seen that obviously the um, the outdoor sports have been making a bigger impact in the Olympics as of late. So, so why is all of this sort of so important for the outdoor industry to be paying attention to? Um, how are we seeing outdoor sports influence uh, the Olympics right now? Yeah, well, you look that rock climbing, you know, was added uh, and surfing was added. And uh, I mean, softball and baseball are played outdoors. I mean, it's not necessarily this audience, but people are fascinated by, you know, humans interacting with the natural elements, you know, and, and dealing with a snowboard half pipe or, you know, a ski racing mountain, you know, hill. And now, you know, with the, with uh, rock climbing being added. So the, the reason that everyone who's going to be watching this, you know, is, is working in the industry because we're all enchanted and fascinated by getting, you know, off of our phones and off of our TVs and getting out of our houses and experiencing, you know, the, the natural world, um, you know, just pulls through to the Olympic movement at, at an elite level, right? You get to see the most elite in the world uh, do a ski race and do a, a snowboarding half pipe and, and do the rock climbing. And right, that's participatory. It's, it's I, I would say that most 30 and 40 and 50 year olds are no longer playing football, right? You might have played in high school. You're not really playing football in pads anymore at 40. And, you know, and that kind of happens in so many sports that were kind of high school athletics and things that we do when we we're young. But we, you know, we are still skiing and we are still snowboarding and we're still mountain biking and we're still cycling and we're still rock climbing so the fact that it's participatory and we get to do it as our hobby and, and as weekend warriors and then we get at the olympics to see the best in the world do it at an elite level and it's why people love golf right you know millions of people golf and they love it but then they get to see the best in the world do it at, at you know what the pga tour and the majors and now at the olympics so i think that there is a um such a connection from the fan of, oh, I do that. I ski, I ski with my kids, I snowboard. And so th that when, when it's put on that Olympic pedestal, it just deepens that connection. And there's such a natural draw to be watching it as a fan and kind of aspire, be like, oh my gosh, it would take me six minutes to navigate that downhill course. And these guys are doing it in 90 seconds. And it just inspires you to get out there and do your best when winter season rolls back around in your own life. But that, that's what I would say, just that unlike so many sports where you sit on the couch, right? How many 40 year olds are still playing baseball on a diamond with nine versus nine and, and a guy throwing 70 miles per hour? Like 
you kind of stop that after Little League. But none of us are stopping our running and our hiking and our biking and our skiing. And I think that's the draw. Yeah, absolutely. I still think that some, an average person should be alongside every Olympic event. So you can see the context of how amazing they are. Um, Yeah. Right. To see somebody come in 12 minutes behind Katie Ledecky would be, uh, would be good television. Exactly. Lowell, that was very crisp. Our audience is going to get such value out of that. Where can they find you if they would like to get in touch? Uh, our Insta is stoked MG. Uh, so stoked management group, stoked MG at stoked MG. Uh, our LinkedIn is also, uh, at stoked MG. Our website is stokedmg.com. And yeah, if the audience has follow-ups or if I can be helping them in any way, you know, with moving their businesses forward, uh, we we're happy to have them and hopefully give a follow to stoked MG, which is really just a page that is, uh, a cheerleader and an advocate for our 27 clients and, and sharing kind of all of the ways that they're, uh, they're taking over the world in their individual sports. Amazing. I'm going to follow. Cause you have some awesome athletes in your roster. That's for sure. 